Well, I think we'll <clears throat> go ahead and, uh, and get started. So welcome everyone to the weekly uh, Forever Green uh, uh, lab meetings. And I'm glad you, you're able to uh, attend today. Today is kind of a special day uh, to have Lee DeHaan and the rest of his team uh, back uh, and present to uh, the Forever Green group here in, uh, in, in Minnesota and beyond. Uh, Lee is unique to us here in Minnesota that, as I always say, Lee kind of represents one of the first Forever Green uh, products as a PhD scientist that came out of the program long before it was called Forever Green as a group was working on the concept of continuous living cover. Uh, so it's always great to have Lee back and need to also tell everyone that Lee played a key role uh, in uh, making it possible for the Intermediate Wheatgrass Kernza program to develop here at the University of Minnesota. Um, the uh, Minnesota Institute for Sustainable Agriculture has an endowed chair and it's a rotating chair. And Lee submitted a proposal and the proposal was really designed to develop this working relationship between the Land Institute and the University of Minnesota to help build a uh, intermediate wheatgrass development program, breeding program. And, uh, and then Jim Anderson stepped up and provided local leadership. So it's been this really wonderful relationship that has developed between the University of Minnesota and the Land Institute around not only uh, the kerns or the enemy wheatgrass, but other uh, species as well. So I'm really proud of the working relationship that uh, the Forever Green Initiative has with, uh, with the Land Institute and excited to have uh, Lee back uh, to give us an update on the uh, genomic work. And I hope some of his breeding work uh, that's coming out of his program and his partners uh, connected to the Land Institute. So I'll, Lee, I'll turn it over uh, to you, so. All right, great, thanks, Don. Um, yeah, we do have a lot of stuff to cover today. We're gonna talk about the, the genome sequence itself that we've developed with partners and then some of how we're using it in genomic selection. And uh, um, I'll talk, if I got time, I'll, I'll talk more about uh, our breeding progress here and ideas for the future. So- Well, Lee, um, right up front, we're gonna, while we have you here, that we'll just take the time people can come and go as they wish, but I would invite you to, to go through and, and uh, give us that update as well today. Yeah, yep, yep. Well, that'll be at the end. So we're going to start with the genome itself. Um, and it was about uh, 2015 or so, um, some years after the Minnesota program, breeding program started, we got some funds at the Land Institute to do some sequencing of, of genomes. And uh, it, it was going to be a big project we knew because we had a, a very large genome, almost the size of wheat. But it was worse than that. It was a self-incompatible hexaploid. Um, and so uh, I started some work uh, with anthroculture to try to get a, a haploid so we can not have uh, two genomes to have to sequence together and assemble, but just uh, one. And uh, succeeded with some haploid plants through anthroculture. But in the end, I, I happened to find a, a twin seedling, which is where you, two plants can grow up from one seed. And one of those can sometimes be a haploid. And managed to find one of those that was actually quite vigorous. And that was the plant we ended up using for the sequencing work. Um, Kevin Dorn, many of you may know, um, came out of the project and he submitted a proposal to the JGI Community Sequencing Program for support. And we thought it was an extremely long shot, but actually got that support, which means uh, a lot of help with assembly and uh, even sequencing work as well, particularly RNA sequencing was a lot of the proposal. So um, the Land Institute started paying for sequencing, um, short read Illumina's in uh, early 2016. Uh, Gene was a company that at that point was had the best approach to assembling these short reads. Um, so it was kind of long inserts between short reads. And uh, 
other approaches may have taken a year or more of computing time to assemble such a thing. And they did it in a couple of days um, for a big price. So we had this rough genome assembly by late 2016. Um, and then JGI worked with um, RNA-seq and, and things that Kevin was doing to annotate that genome. And it was available by 2018. And uh, it's still up on Phytosome. Um, that uh, it was called version two because we had to do a little bit of extra work. Um, you can read about it on their website about all the details of how we did that uh, genome assembly. Um, then uh, long reads, PacBio is becoming more common, uh, more affordable. So we decided let's polish this thing up with uh, filling in the gaps using some long reads. Um, did about 20x of long reads and uh, started applying that to the genome, discovered that we couldn't fit these long reads over the genome very well because basically there's too many mistakes in the genome. It was uh, kind, of, uh, kind of a mess in some areas. And so uh, JGI support extended to being able to do PacBio CCS uh, long reads um, from scratch and started over basically and then applied high C to help assemble those um, and that's just been wrapping it up over the past six months and, and uh, version three is now just about ready to publish. Um, and Steve Larson is going to talk a little more about where version three is at here um, next. And so I won't go into that. But yeah, so that's as far as I'm going to go for now. I'm going to turn it over to Steve. Hopefully Steve's on the line here and is going to jump in. Steve, you here? I'm stopping sharing. You can start. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, I will try <clears throat> try to share my screen. It's there. Okay. Good to go. Start at the beginning. Uh, so. Um, Thank you, Lee, for getting things started. Um, so yeah, it's my, my privilege to uh, to highlight some of the work that's been done um, by a lot of different people um, on this intermediate wheatgrass genome assembly. Um, this is not necessarily I listed some authors here. It's not necessarily there's other people that have <clears throat> certainly contributed to the project. I I'm just mentioning here some of the people, uh, some of the work that I'm going to highlight specifically today um, is it was done by um, people listed here. Um, as Lee mentioned, that the story, um, well, the, the story really started with, um, or in part started with the development of um, a high density. Um, Linkage map, GBS linkage map with 10, over 10,000 GBS markers um, developed from seven different populations of uh, full sib families of intermediate wheatgrass that were um, developed at the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas, and at the University of Minnesota, and uh, also here in Logan, Utah, the USDA. Um, this map was. Um, Intermediate wheatgrass, it's a, it's a allohexaploid, meaning like, like bread wheat, it's a allohexaploid, it has a 21 linkage groups. Um, and that's shown here in this figure where we're aligning the, the, the GBS markers from the linkage map to the seven chromosomes of barley. So on the Y axis, here's the, the seven chromosomes of barley ordered from, um, you know, from, from top to bottom, and then the, the 21 linkage groups of intermediate wheatgrass on the x-axis. And you can see a um, collinear alignments of those, of the intermediate, wheat, intermediate wheatgrass linkage groups to barley. Um, there's, there's essentially three, being an allohexaploid, it has three copies of each of the seven chromosomes of barley. And you can see that here in this figure. Um, Lee mentioned this uh, this haploid plant. Um, 
this figure shows it was developed the 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 plant used for sequencing was a was a haploid plant derived from a twin seedling which is seen in this figure this wasn't the actual haploid seedling um, that that Lee used but um, it looks something like this it's a and this happens in wheat and other species you get two seedlings coming out of one seed um, sometimes those seedlings are haploids sometimes they're triploids um, you get different kind of different things happen with that but um, in in one case Lee found one that was a haploid plant which makes sequencing a lot easier and that haploid plant um, came from this mother plant 5353 which was which was by design used as a common parent in two of the in two of the mapping populations here these uh, um, the two these two here WG families were were derived from in part from this this same mother plant that gave rise to that twin seedling um, so that and then that was used so those linkage maps from that high density GDS linkage map they, those were used in part to guide the assembly of that first uh, version one and version two um, short read assemblies um, by in the NR gene assembly. Uh, Lee mentioned the um, the long read, uh, uh, the new long read assembly um, developed from um, pack bio reads. Um, the main benefit here is that we get much larger high confidence contigs in the uh, to work with in the assembly. So this figure here in the upper right shows um, the distribution of of high confidence contigs in the five largest chromosomes. You can see there's very large, um, very large contigs involved in each one of those five large chromosomes. Um, th this version three assembly wa was, they did use the um, original version one and version two maps um, to guide the initial assembly of the uh, long read assembly. Um, so it still has, it still has that kind of, um, it still has some anchoring and ties to the original GBS map, but the order of these contigs was refined, um, as Lee mentioned, using high C data, which is in the, you can see a high C heat map in the lower right of this figure. Um, when things work correctly, you, you would get a diagonal line of contacts um, so these are the, the 21 chromosome pairwise comparisons of, of high C reads from the 21 chromosomes. And when things work perfectly, you'd have a, um, I think you'd have a near perfect diagonal here. You can see there's some, some wings on that diagonal. I think those probably correspond to the, to the centromeres, but I'm not exactly sure how to explain that. But um, I think the the interpretation is that this is a um, this looks very good. Uh, Lee mentioned it was polished using the they used that original Illumina data to polish this. The the pack bio reads are not they're not quite a, the actual sequences are not quite as reliable as Illumina short read Illumina data. So they use the Illumina data to to clean that up in the very end. Um, uh, Lee mentioned, uh, yeah, Kevin Dorn, uh, when he was, uh, well, he was at University of Minnesota, I think working for Kansas State at University at the time, um, used uh, DNA sequence data from a, a variety of um, different diploid, and, diploid tritici species, relatives of wheat and barley to try to identify the three subgenomes of, of, the interme of intermediate wheatgrass. And uh, um, basically uh, he found one of the, and this was sort, it was, it's sort of known, but um, 
there were some, we had some ideas from previous literature, what these might be, um, but um, essentially, um, Phainopyrum elongatum is one of the diploids that um, had sequences matching uh, one set of the of seven intermediate wheatgrass chromosomes, and then um, um, species from genus Pseudognaria, um, including Pseudognaria spicata of North America, um, were very similar to another set of the seven chromosomes from inter intermediate wheatgrass. And then the third set of chromosomes uh, from intermediate wheatgrass uh, match uh, sequences from Dasypyrum velosum. So on this figure on the right here, this shows um, species listed at the top, including a uh, bread wheat, uh, Triticum istivum, is seen third from the top there, and 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 Agelops relatives of of bread wheat included in that in that first group at the very top, and then next to that is um, would be th the Thinopyrum would include one of the genomes from intermediate wheatgrass, the the Thinopyrum subgenome, and then uh, um, at the very bottom, just for reference. Is Hordium vul vulgare in this in this phylogeny? Barley is at the very bottom, the most distantly related species in this group, um, and the Pseudognaria and the Dasypyrum fall in between those two groups of, of between wheat and barley. So the um, another thing I'll say from this, people are familiar with the the story of the evolution of wheat has. Red wheat has three diploid ancestors. All of those diploid ancestors of, of bread wheat would fall in this, in this relatively small clade of triticum and agelop species shown at the top. And so one thing that's kind of interesting is how, how diverse those three different diploid ancestors are relative to say the three diploid ancestors of wheat. Um, this figure um, uh, shows the different, meant to show the differences in size of the three subgenomes of intermediate wheatgrass. Um, the smallest chromosomes come from the Pseudorognaria species, the S subgenome. Um, comprised 3.24 uh, billion bases or gigabase of the intermediate wheatgrass genome. And the largest one was the from Thinopyrum uh, elongatum, which was the one closest to wheat. And those seven chromosomes comprised 4.3 billion bases or, or 4.3 gigabases of the uh, nearly 12 gigabase intermediate wheatgrass subgenome. So it's a, it's a very large subgenome, um, almost as large as bread wheat. Um, just for comparison, even, even the smallest chromosome, and there is quite a, quite a difference in chromosome size ranging from about 380 million bases to nearly 800 million bases for each chromosome. The smallest chromosome is about the same size as the entire genome of rice. Um, this figure shows very nice alignments of the of the version three intermediate wheatgrass assembly, twenty one chromosomes um, aligned to the, the uh, seven corresponding chromosomes of, of, of barley. So you see um, fairly, fairly continuous linear, collinear alignments. There might be evidence of in a few places, like say on chromosome one in the very upper left here, you can see a couple regions where the, where the slope of the alignments change inversely indicating possibly uh, an inversion, uh, a large 
well, I mean, th they look small, but those would still be, could be relatively large pieces of DNA, mil millions of base pairs that might be flipped in, in, in relative to each other between intermediate wheatgrass and, and barley. And actually it's kind of interesting. You might even see the same, the same inversions in, well, no, I'm gonna take that back. Okay. Um, this figure shows um, alignments then of the, of, uh, okay, I see my, it says my battery is running low on my computer. So let me make sure I'm plugged in. Um, alignments of the, of the version three uh, wheatgrass chromosomes corresponding to barley chromosome four um, aligned back to the original consensus map, linkage groups 10, 11, and 12 of the original consensus map from which the, the physical maps were, uh, which, well, that, those, those consensus map, the original consensus map from 2017 was actually used to guide the assembly of the initial map, which was used to guide the assembly of the of the version three map. So, I mean, you can see very good alignments of of the of the markers of of this chromosome of these chromosomes to the original consensus map. You might say, well, that's not totally surprising if that <clears throat> if that map was used to to guide the, the assemblies, um, but you can see the same, uh, ver very similar patterns of alignment in maps developed by Kayla Altendorf um, in her, from her PhD work at the University of Minnesota. Um, so, so Kayla's maps there shown on the right were, were developed from completely independent data. They're independent genetic maps. So Essentially, it's it's a nice, very nice independent confirmation of the of the uh, ordering of these of these maps. There are there are some differences between the genetic and physical map, which not not shown on this chromosome, or, but on some of the other chromosomes. I'm not going to show, and they they seem to be reproducible between the two genetic maps. So there there still might be some. Well, there does appear to be some differences between the genetic and physical maps, um, which could be real. It, it, it could be that, um, for example, Lee mentioned that it could be that the haploid plant ha had some unique rearrangements or something like that, or it could be mistakes in the assembly. But um, I think the conclusion is that, that we really have um, high quality um, physical and genetic maps to work with now. And, and we can look at these maps if, if there are some regions, um, you know, we can look at these, these comparisons and to determine if certain regions may or may not have some, some problems. Um, this figure shows um, uh, principal coordinates analysis of 1,916 genotypes or plants from 334 wild intermediate wheatgrass accessions from the USDA National Plant Germplasm System. Those are shown in yellow and brown on the, um, the left two thirds of the figure um, compared with 2,227 Kernza plants from um, the Land Institute um, shown in green here on the bottom right. Um, plants from the University of Manitoba shown in blue in the upper right. And then um, turns of plants from the University of Minnesota uh, breeding program shown in red in between the, the others. Um, so it appears that um, this is kind of interesting. It, it's kind of a surprise to at least me that that the Kernza is so 
separates so nicely from the from the remainder of everything we know about intermediate wheatgrass. Um, and it does appear that there's some some parts of the intermediate wheatgrass, the wild germplasm that's more related to the kerns of plants. And we can see that here in the next figure. This shows the distribution of those of the uh, of the wild intermediate wheatgrass successions. If you recognize this part of the world, uh, the Mediterranean Sea in the lower left. Um, so the, the, the distribution of, inter, of intermediate wheatgrass in the wild ranges from, uh, from Southern Europe, Central and Southern Europe um, into uh, East, Eastern Asia um, <clears throat> through the Caucasus region. Um, the plants that were most similar to Kernza um, are shown in the heavier shaded browner colors. And in particular, um, some of the accessions that were most related to Kernza were these ones I circled here. Um, um, yeah, above the Black Sea region. So the steps of... Uh, Oh, I think this area here, the, it's called the, the Stavropol steppes and the uh, Eastern Ukraine region. Um, <clears throat> we've used the, the, uh, these genome assemblies to um, identify genes, um, many genes uh, associated with uh, domestication traits um, that, that Lee and Jim Anderson and others are, are trying to improve in the breeding of intermediate wheatgrass. Um, one of these, one of the most consistent results has been um, a marker or single nucleotide polymorphism um, on chromosome seven at position uh, 66 million um, 140,981 base pairs on chromosome seven. This, this SNP is associated with the brittle rachis trait. And this has been found um, by Kayla Altendorf at the University of Minnesota. It's also been independently uh, found and verified by Jared Crane in the, in the, in the breeding program of the Land Institute and also in, in plant materials that I'm evaluating here in, in, in Logan, Utah. And this data actually comes from, this is from my population in Logan, Utah, but we saw very similar results. Um, Kayla and Jared saw very similar results in those programs. So it's really nice um, example of, you know, of a gene that's been verified and validated across all three programs. Um, it's it's kind of interesting. This this gene this particular marker is about 400 base pairs away from um, a mutation in the brittle rachis two gene, which was um, it's a two there's a two base pair deletion in in this gene in intermediate wheatgrass, um, which is interesting because it, it's. This gene was a, a this brittle rachis gene was identified in barley, and in barley, the the non the non non brittle phenotype was caused by an eleven base pair deletion, um, very close to this two base pair deletion, or well in a very similar area I should say, and it results in the exact same kind of frame shift. In, in the gene. So we see the same frame shift, shape, frame shift mutation in intermediate wheatgrass as was seen when they identified this gene in barley. And so um, I've made PCR primers flanking this two base pair mutation. And this panel at, this, this panel at the bottom of the figure shows um, the segregation of that mutation 
um, in our breeding program. So we'll, I've just got this result a couple days ago. So we'll be screen, we'll, we'll go through, we'll screen this marker through the whole breeding program and, and see if we can verify that this mutation is causing this, this trait. Um, other evidence of the genome has been used to identify other evidence of domestication by DNA filtering. This is work done by Sujan Mamidi, um, where they sequenced uh, 12, well, 74 early breeding lines. Um, these, these were materials, I think, from early cycles of selection at the Land Institute. And then, um, well, this was a preliminary analysis. I think there's more data now, but initially they resequenced 12 advanced lines from the most advanced cycles of selection at the Land Institute. And so it's comparing diversity um, in one 100 kilobase regions or windows of the genome, comparing diversity between the early lines and advanced lines to see if there's evidence of selection or filtering where the early lines might have less diversity than the advanced lines. And so on the right, here's a figure where he um, uh, cut off of where they thinks the more, most significant um, filtering has occurred, windows where the most filtering occurred. And this is this is a figure then or a summary of that analysis, um, a heat map of that diversity ratio or pot um, nucleotide diversity ratio between early and late line, early and advanced lines. And so the, um, the darker uh, shaded um, points in the genome or windows in the genome um, represent areas where there's been selection and and filtering and narrowing of the diversity. So um, just very quick conclusions here. Um, we have high quality physical and genetic maps of the intermediate wheatgrass genome that are being used to elucidate the evolution of intermediate wheatgrass and its relationships to uh, wheat and barley and, and other domesticated cereals. And uh, um, you'll, as you'll hear, hear later uh, from Jared and Lee, there's many ways that this sequence, this, these tools and resources can be used to facilitate the domestication of intermediate wheatgrass. Uh, so I'll just, yeah, again, thank everybody um, that's contributed to this work and and uh, the different institutions. There's been a lot of, as Lee mentioned, a great deal of institutional support from the Land Institute, Kansas State University, University of Minnesota, um, the, the DOE, Joint Genome Institute, Hudson Alpha, and uh, yeah, thank you. All right, thanks a lot, Steve. Jared, are you, are you up for it? Yeah, right, Steve, right can I now. ask one question? Steve, sure. Steve, are you guys yes, suggesting that the map is now of the quality that we won't need any additional investment in it in the future? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's I think that's a fair statement. All right. We got one map that's good, but then everyone wants the next map that's good. Done. So that's what I'm asking you guys, <laughs> Lee, Lee. That's what I'm asking. Will, will there, is there a need to continue an investment? Yeah, I'll talk about that a little bit later. All right. And Steve, I think you got to uh, stop share before I yeah. can. Okay. So everyone, this is uh, Jerry Crane. He is a postdoc with us uh, based in Jesse Poland's lab at Kansas State University. Um, been working on leading the genomic selection and in intermediate wheatgrass now for, boy, what is it, Jared, four or five years? Yeah, right, right at a little over four. Okay. So, and Steve, you're still... Okay. You have to stop the share. I'm trying. You should go in through your Zoom. You should see where it says share screen somewhere. Yeah, I'm trying. My Zoom is minimized and I can't seem to... Little green box.
Yeah, so, so as Lee mentioned, uh, I'm going to do my best, but I had some unexpected challenges. If things melt down, he, he might uh, take over my slides and, and finish up. But right now, things are, are holding together. Well, I'm so sorry. I don't know why I can't. Oh, okay. Found it. Sorry. Hey. Okay, so I think I should be sharing. Uh, yep. And slideshow. Okay, and, and you can see now the full screen. Looks good, Jared. Okay. Yeah, so, so I've been with uh, the genomic selection part really since 2017 uh, when it started. And some of this I presented a little bit before on, but I, I guess I wanna do a, a good foundation of what we're doing and, and how we're trying to move this essentially, you know, wild plant to something that you run the combine over on thousands or, or hopefully millions of acres someday. Uh, and, and how do we do that? Uh, really, it comes down to the, the breeder's equation. So we know how to make uh, genetic gain. And those are a factor of uh, the, the selection intensity, uh, the selection accuracy, the amount of genetic variance that we start with, and uh, the time that it takes to uh, complete that breeding cycle from one generation to the next. So with genomic selection, one of the, the biggest uh, benefits is a reduction in that cycle time. Uh, this is our uh, basic breeding program that's been followed for the last four cycles at the Land Institute that starts with our parents. Uh, we cross those. In late summer, we start uh, the, the F1 seedlings, uh, genotype those, and by the end of October, we have our, our predictions already made and can go in and select out the best 100 plants that we want. Uh, and those can go to intermate and form that cycle right away. The, the second part is updating that GS model because we want uh, the most accurate model we can get so then we take some plants that weren't the, the best hundred and put them in a training population to evaluate in the future and, and the phenotypic data from that then is used to update the, the training model in future cycles. So in this case, we get uh, instead of a two or three year cycle that uh, the, the denominator turns into one. So our, our selection accuracy turns into just the intensity that we can apply our, our accuracy and, and the, the genetic variation. So that results in the, the amount of genetic gain we get. So that's one of the, the first big chunks uh, that we can manipulate in the program uh, is breeding cycle time. That alone, if you go from a two-year cycle to a one-year cycle, should give you a 50% a gain in genetic, or 50% genetic gain. But we've still got uh, these other three variables that we can mess with. And selection intensity is one that can be changed. Now, interestingly, in this graph, um, this is the, the population size that you would need to evaluate if you were going to select the best 100 or, or if you were only selecting 100 individuals to form the uh, next generation. So the, the first cycles at the Land Institute were purely phenotypic selection. Uh, the, the population size was right about 10,000, giving a, a selection intensity of uh, about 2.67. Uh, with genomic selection, we've actually backed down just based on resources. It is more costly to genotype those plants. So we're only genotyping about 4,000, but we still have a selection intensity of about 2.38, uh, I, I believe. So you can make greater gains if you select higher out on this distribution, but it's very exponential going from... Uh, 
uh, 4,000 to 10,000 plants gives you about a uh, 0.35 gain. But then going from 10,000 up to uh, over 20,000 only gives you the same accuracy. So you've had to really more than double resources. And, and if you really get out on this end, you'll get up into populations of 100,000 for very little increase in that genetic gain. Uh, and this is, is theoretically, it expects that you make the correct selection, that you don't have any errors in your uh, breeding program recording. Uh, a little bit of research on this uh, from a, a paper in 1999, they looked at what happens if you have a, an error rate of 1% in your breeding program at different selection intensities, and, and that could actually end up in a 77% a decrease in your, your selection differential. So the, the example of this particularly is one thing they were looking at at a very high selection intensity. If you had a 1% error rate, you might think you were selecting with this selection intensity of 3.24 with errors, and this is a drastic case, but in reality, they'd evaluated all these plants. They were really only getting a, a 0.73 selection differential. So sometimes uh, evaluating that bigger population size, it isn't going to be necessarily the best answer for long-term. And by backing this selection differential down, we also, uh, decrease our, our loss of genetic variance through the models. So within that breeding program, we've just seen uh, intensity. Uh, another big factor is your selection accuracy. Uh, before genomic selection, uh, Lee had basically uh, pedigrees and you can make a relationship matrix on that pedigree based on just the theoretical expectation. Uh, for example, 0.5 uh, would be full siblings. Uh, 0.25 would be half, half siblings sharing the same father or mother. Uh, and, and this is constant throughout. So you just have this expected value. Now, um, in genetics, Mendelian genetics, we don't know on average these values are correct, but you may have more or less relationship. Uh, and this is kind of the same type of, of graph, only based on the, the genomic relationship markers. And uh, you can see there's more individuals here, but the value of, of those individuals can range much more greatly than just through a pedigree. So, so looking at this, um, and this is just a table in, in one of the papers that we've, we've got coming out. Uh, I, I just wanna highlight these two columns. Model two, this is using the, the pedigree. So just that uh, expected value, uh, no more, no less, and, and the heritability for various traits. And then when we add the actual molecular markers that are capturing that Mendelian segregation, that random chance of how much did uh, one individual resemble the father or mother compared, how did that deviate from just that theoretical average? Uh, in all cases, our heritability has went up, so we should have a more accurate selection this way. And then a, a second way that we're improving accuracy is the initial phenotypic cycles were all, uh, they, they were never continuous at the same time. So example, in that breeding cycle six, it was evaluated in the field in 2016 and 17, but it was never evaluated with any other cycles. Uh, with that, with the rapid cycling each year, we have TLI cycle seven plants uh, being evaluated the same calendar year as TLI cycle eight and nine plants. So we're hoping that this is going to give us a, a more accurate assessment of that plant value that we can uh, translate into greater genetic gains. And, and then the final 
uh, variable that we can manipulate is genetic variance. Um, within the breeding program, it's random intermating. We do know that maternal parent, uh, but it's essentially just a, a pollen cloud, so unknown father. However, with our molecular markers, we can go back and assign uh, paternity, and, and then we have the, the full pedigree of, of all of our genotyped individuals. So this, uh, once we know the, the, the full paternity, uh, then Lee includes this selection, which can keep us from narrowing that genetic variance down too fast and trying to keep uh, as much genetic variance in that population so we can make long-term uh, progress as possible. So what does this look like then when we uh, um, evaluate some historic data? Um, this is a graph that's showing that relative gain just based on the, uh, the variable time and uh, selection intensity in that breeder's equation. Now, in this case, uh, genetic variance is a constant, and we also have a, a constant for the, uh, the higher um, accuracy, because if we would look at one, uh, one which would be the same cycle time to complete a, a genomic selection and phenotypic selection, and one on selection intensity where we had the same intensity under both genomic and phenotypic selection, uh, that value would already be greater than one, which is representing that higher increase in, in selection accuracy. But when we look at uh, a, a trait, this one's just spike yield. Uh, within the program, we've dropped our selection intensity down a little bit, but our cycle time is, is one half. Um, and we can end up getting about a 2.3 uh, uh, or 2.4 fold in, in, in uh, gain. Uh, so just, this is the, a, a table showing those exact gains uh, for different traits. So with free threshing, uh, we could expect a 3.8 fold increase moving to genomic selection from uh, phenotypic selection. Uh, spike yield, that was the, the one we were just looking at. It, it's actually 2.6. And for things like seed mass, uh, you could even get up to a six-fold gain uh, compared to phenotypic selection. So the, the second part of my talk is going to look at putting all this together. How do we run the, the entire program uh, from start to finish? And the, this is just the genomic selection part. And the next slide we'll look out and see the whole yearly progression. Uh, but this starts at the end of, end of July, 1st of August. Uh, there's still training population data that's being recorded. That ends up finishing up uh, about by, by mid-August, at which point the the next generation seedlings have already been started. I spend a lot of work updating our GS model. So I have about 45 days uh, to plug in all the new data, evaluate and, and make sure that our models are, are the best they can be. Um, and then in, during that same time, tissue collection is occurring, uh, staggered with GBS library preparation and DNA sequencing uh, to get that volume of 4,000 through, it's about 21 days for any one of those tasks, but they end up getting staggered so that our first DNA sequencing is actually coming back sometimes before our last GBS library preps are completed. Uh, once that data comes in, it's QC'd uh, for quality, uh, and then we call SNPs and actually uh, to make those genomic predictions, paternity analysis it only takes about a day. Uh, and then a couple of days for, for Lee to make his final selections followed by uh, getting those selected plants in the field or, or the greenhouse. So, so this says, uh, backs up looking at the entire year. Uh, we were, the, the previous slide, we were just right here on genomic prediction and selection. Once those plants go to the field, 
uh, that, well, excuse me, there's two parts. There's the breeding population that's in the greenhouse. So October through uh, December, making sure that those are vernalized and, and cloned. And then uh, by May, end up threshing that seed in the greenhouse. The, the second track, the, the validation in the field population is growing and then phenotyping, phenotypic data starts coming off of that uh, mid-May through uh, the end of July, at which point we, we start our, our cycle over again. And I, I've already shown part of this, but, but just uh, those, those aspects of the breeding cycle are staggered. So this year, uh, TLI cycle 10, will start collecting the first year of data on it, but there'll also be a second year of data on the, the cycle nine that was planted in the field in 2019, and a third year in, uh, in cycle eight, which was planted in, in 2018. So each year just within the, the breeding program, there's about 3,500 plants uh, representing those three, three cycles that are getting evaluated. And we hope that this staggered selection also allows us to make gains for uh, traits like sustained yield, where you're gonna have to evaluate out multiple years before you can pick on that, on that trait. So, the, so that's what's been implemented the last four years. I just will briefly end with uh, kind of the results we're seeing. Um, so in 2017, that was our, our first year of cycle seven. Uh, Lee just finished collecting the last year of data in 2020 on this population. And then this fall we'll be starting the, the 11th uh, cycle uh, in, in late July. So looking at this, uh, the, the question is, how, how well are we doing? Is this working? Uh, are we making those gains that we thought were theoretically possible? Uh, so we'll see several graphs. This one's just pre-threshing, and then each panel has a, a C8 would be cycle eight, uh, C9 for cycle nine. On the x-axis is the the genomic selection predicted value. So this is the value that we predicted on the seedling uh, before that plant ever went to the field. And then the observed value is the value that was observed a year or two years later. Um, and overall for free threshing, we can see that we get a really uh, significant correlation uh, with this trait it's probably one of the best behaved traits as far as making a prediction and, and getting good uh, correlation between our predicted and observed. When we look at uh, seed mass, so in this one, we have all the, the cycle seven through nine, again, greater than 0.5 correlation throughout the years. And cycle nine, I will say this prediction was made including data from cycle eight, and cycle seven and cycle six. Um, shattering, another well-behaved trait uh, throughout all three cycles, uh, getting very high correlation. And, and then to show, uh, show everything, uh, spike yield trait that we're very interested in uh, across those three years, much lower correlation in cycle seven, uh, 0.25, still significant, but much lower than, than some of those key domestication traits. In cycle eight, uh, we didn't actually have any correlation. Uh, cycle nine last year, uh, again, back to uh, closer to C7. So C8 could be uh, uh, just a, the year environment could be in influencing that. And we hope as our, our training models get more data and more information, that will be better. So then uh, a second way to look at this is how well did those selected parents perform compared to the unselected of the same generation? After those plants intermate in the greenhouse, then they're planted right beside the, the validation population. And so the second year we can actually observe how the parents performed compared to the uh, the unselected part of that population. 
and, and this is looking at cycle seven. So this is two years after we made the prediction. This is a histogram with the, the solid black line is the entire population average. And then in purple is the selected parents with the, the dashed line being the average of the parents. So for shattering, the parents were, were nearly 0.5 units less shattering uh, and in shattering we want to lower is better. Uh, spike yield, uh, I believe is about 0.11 grams uh, more seed. Uh, free threshing, about 11% higher free threshing. And uh, seed mass again, that these would be our, our four big traits that we're, we're selecting on. All of them are our selected parents are, are moving in the direction that we would hope. Uh, and just as a, a final slide, um, these are the same traits we've been looking at, but we have two years of cycle 17 in, in 2019 and 2020, and our first year of cycle eight data. Uh, in, in 2020, and this is the, the mean parent value, the mean unselected value, uh, and percent change with an asterisk being if that is a statistically uh, significant change. So for free threshing uh, each year in cycle seven, uh, we can see those parents were, were continually better than the unselected. And, and that goes through for, for all traits. Uh, Spike yield probably has about the, uh, the lowest rate of gain, 3.6%. It's not statistically significant, but that it's still uh, in the, the direction we would hope it, it is promising. And, and Lee will mention as well too, that these plants, once they spend a year in the greenhouse and they go to the field, that they don't respond as well to that. So while we've tried to make a fair comparison in some regards, this is still a, a biased comparison, but even with that, we're, we're seeing gains uh, that show uh, evidence that our, our genomic selection is working. So just to, to finish up, we, we know that we can decrease our breeding cycle with GS. We can get pretty accurate uh, predictions, especially on some domestication traits and we can really increase the, the speed of our genetic gain. Uh, where are we going with this? Uh, where, where are some things that I try to see in the future, continual evaluation, so really making sure that every year uh, our selections are, are moving the direction that we wanna go. Uh, modeling some of these perennial observations uh, in annual crops, you run a model one year, the next year you plant uh, the crop again. Uh, in, in this case, it's the exact same plant. Uh, how do you statistically model that the most appropriately? Uh, and then with the genomic selection, all of the, the machineries in place right away to implement GWAS, and, and then also looking at, at different marker systems. So with that, uh, Lee, that covers up everything I was going to present and, and a lot of people have uh, really helped make make the results possible that, that I was been able to share. All right, thanks, Jared. Do you note that we've got an hour up, but uh, Don said we can go on a little longer and I'll cover some more stuff. If people want to hang with, you're free to go, of course, as well, but uh, got a few more topics to go to. If you can stop your sharing there, Jared. I will share mine again. All right, am I back everybody? Yep. All right, so um, Jared just mentioned a new marker technologies. I wanna talk a little bit about that because we have uh, two grants currently covering development of a new marker technology, the FFAR uh, grant uh, with Minnesota and the, the CAP grant as well includes funding for this. So. Um, Part of what limits our genomic selection is the cost of those markers, um, well over $10 a plant, depending on some things. But um, we'd like to be able to get that down to a couple of dollars a plant uh, instead. So um, our technique is, is to follow uh, a little bit the idea of this 
this paper you can see uh, here um, developing a, a practical haplotype graph, which means um, sequencing a lot of other individuals and uh, um, being able to identify the association of different um, genomic differences with each other, like so that are associated together because they, they tend to go along in haplotypes, um, as this is kind of the common in human genetics. Um, it's been implemented in plants where we can do selfing, but hasn't been used in outcrossing species yet. Um, let's see if I can get this to advance. There we go. So, um, yeah, so th this is sort of the, the idea of these haplotype blocks. And um, down here in the lower right, um, you can do a low sequence coverage. So instead of having something like the uh, GBS, where we, we try to get you know, three to five reads on, e on each uh, marker. Here you, you only have one if you do a low, a low sequence, just a random uh, skim sequencing, which is very inexpensive because of the no special uh, or very easy library prep on that. So um, you don't need very much coverage. If you can hit these parts at random, the trouble is that you, you don't really know um, it's hard to impute all the missing data. And so uh, if you can develop a database that tells you the association between these different markers into these, these haplotype blocks, then if you have a, a read in each one of these blocks, you can basically impute and say what is all there, uh, what's present in, in that genome. So um, results in a very low uh, cost if we can do it. So Ying Hu is probably still on the call here. Um, she can answer more questions. Her, her project with us um, under these grants. It's, it's worked really well in sorghum. This is making these same genomic predictions and you see it in red is, is GBS, the type of approach we've been using and then implementing a 0.1 or 0.01 coverage skim sequencing and they're getting just as good at predictions um, across all these. So this is the approach we hope to have working it within a, a couple of years in intermediate wheat grass. Um, Getting those the, the, those phases is, is tricky. Um, as I said, the first time we're using an outcrosser. So um, using some new approaches, we're trying to figure out what the best way to go is. Um, this is one software approach that's that's been developed to hopefully help us phase these uh, deployed outcrossing genomes. Okay, I wanna talk about a very different topic. Um, Don requested too here to, to mention our breeding uh, progress over time. So um, for a paper we're working on, I uh, did a, a review going all the way back here, uh, many different years of, of breeding program. And I, and I zeroed it out with, uh, because it's evaluated across seven different uh, environments, uh, years, locations, uh, ways of growing the plants. Uh, it's kind of partially replicated, but so I took out the, the, the zero from uh, being the starting population, which was really the first cycle of selection done by the USDA Big Flats Plant Material Center. Um, they had another five years of work, and then I picked it up here and did a, <clears throat> this is what I started with, which included their second cycle of selection. Um, then I was doing two years per cycle, for, um, several cycles of selection, and then went to one year or for two cycles, and I went to one year per cycle. Um, you can see after the 17th or uh, 2017, then uh, it would be two years. And then we started genomic selection, which is right here. I don't have plants to represent, just, just, just look at that, uh, that cycle. Um, so this here is the result of the first cycle of genomic selection. And see this accelerated uh, progress over time, uh, which is exciting to see, uh, but I, I redid this um, instead of with calendar year, went to a cycle uh, year and did it for many different traits. So here up in the upper left is this change in grain yield. And you see, if you look at per generation, it's a pretty nice straight line. So uh, oddly, although we've used many different approaches uh, over, over the years, uh, many different size populations, uh, many different ways of doing selection, the most important thing is seems to be perhaps uh, you know, cycling through these generations. Um, and that's not too surprising given how important it is to, to be doing this reshuffling of these uh, genes and uh, um, 
the importance of the, the number of cycles and the rate at which you can do them. So that kind of re-emphasizes re what Jared was talking about with moving towards genomic selection one cycle per year um, to accelerate beyond what, where we've been, getting more cycles done at a, at a faster pace being important. Um, also threw in here a, a lot of different uh, traits. Um, this is seed mass, uh, mass per seed going up strongly. This is shattering going down. Uh, this is the number of heads per so this, this is all done not on space plants, but actually a production scale type uh, or production um, arrangement of the plant. So in rows or in solid seeded, so narrow rows uh, plots. Um, and so this is the density of heads in a plot. Um, surprisingly going up, even though I was selecting always on yield per head and never on the number of uh, heads per plant or heads per area. Um, yield per head and uh, percent naked seed uh, going up strongly over time. It's all a little bit hard to tell because we're zeroing out based on uh, th that starting population. So I made a table here giving you the starting uh, value um, for the cycle of zero. And then this is across eight cycles, what's the, the slope of that regression? On average, how much progress are we making? So. Yield is, uh, of course, the most interesting thing. Uh, here we're seeing a 58 kilograms per hectare per cycle is our rate of progress. Um, over eight cycles, we've got a 200% increase uh, in yield uh, measured in these, these plots. So that's really, you know, it's exciting. It's, it's rapid um, relative to modern grain breeding in Kansas or, or wheat breeding in Kansas has been about 11 kilograms per hectare uh, per yield increase or per, yeah, uh, yield increase has been on that, that range of 11 kilograms. So 58 is, is really good by comparison. Um, so by, by extrapolation of this, this rate of progress, uh, we need about 23 more cycles to uh, match the current uh, yield of Kansas wheat. Um, that's assuming some, <clears throat> some advantage of a better management as was also seen in wheat. Um, but so I, I, we're interested in how to go faster and, and using the genome help us go faster. So I'm gonna put up a couple of ideas that we have along those, those lines. Um, earlier this year, or last year published this article on um, accelerating domestication in intermediate wheatgrass um, using genome editing and we're trying to leverage that genome information. Um, Steve Larson, really helped to put together this table, for instance, where we look at um, various traits that are important, for instance, it's brittle rachis, free threshing, grain size, et cetera, um, what genes are known in other species like barley, rice, wheat, um, and where uh, the similar gene is present in intermediate wheatgrass. And uh, then in the paper, talk about what's the potential for making edits to those genes to, to get them to be of a similar allele or similar function to what we have in our domestic crops. Um, so a program is underway in Denmark to, to try to, to do this. Um, and you know, the first step is getting a good transformation technique uh, working. And I don't think they're, they're quite there yet on that step, but they uh, did get another grant as well to, to accelerate that project. Another thing we're doing is trying to bring in some diversity from wheat. Um, for about three or four years now, I've been crossing to some wheat, wheat grass hybrids <clears throat> and then back crossing to the wheat grass. Um, trying to obtain a, a full set of um, plants that will have each wheat chromosome added uh, to, to each line. So this example here is uh, chromosome 1B of wheat is added. Um, and we're using the, the sequence of intermediate wheatgrass and wheat. Uh, Catherine Turner helped us with this analysis. Uh, she's another scientist here at the Land Institute, previously from Minnesota. So um, we now have this full set and, and we're starting to evaluate them in the field. Um, also looking at small introgression. So might we get uh, just a small piece and being able to track that with uh, skim sequencing. So those are some of our latest ideas and uh, 
realize we've, we've gone a little bit long here, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, stick around as long as people want. Lee, tell us uh, a little more about the uh, gene editing. So uh, I noticed Carmen Pernholtz uh, went, uh, went dark when you said that. Uh, so, <laughs> so are you thinking of using uh, gene editing uh, basically uh, as proof of concept for various uh, traits? Yeah, so um, in Denmark, they realized uh, in Europe, uh, they have some legal barriers to gene editing and food crops. So um, the way they, they wrote it up in the proposal is to use the editing as a proof of concept and yeah. then use mutagenesis to obtain the same exact gene by random mutations. Uh, so if they find something that works, then they would grow approximately maybe 500,000 or a million mutated plants treated with mutagen um, and then use some fancy sequencing approaches to find that same uh, mutated gene out there in those uh, that mut mutagenesis population um, to get that same function. A little bit backward to do the you know, to do the gene editing first, considering how difficult it is, probably relative to mutagenesis, but um, the idea is to determine some methods that work first and then get it through uh, mutagenesis. I, I would think uh, in a different regulatory situation, you could go ahead and use the mutated um, or the, the edited plant as well. Um, there'd be no way of telling the difference between the, the, the mutagenesis plant versus the edited plant. Yeah, but you know the game with wheat, right? I, I don't know. It, is there a gene editing things going on in wheat right now? No, not that I'm aware of. But, you know, I'm not a, no. other people should answer that question, but uh, you know, that is basically the major restriction, right? In terms of gene editing in wheat, uh, the, the food industry and the markets in the world uh, would not receive it. So are we, I'm just arguing that we make sure we consider that as we move uh, currents forward in the world. Yeah, so I mean, obviously the, their plan in place is, is to not use edited genes for human consumption directly, but to use mutagenized plants. Yeah, right. The gene editing is moving forward in wheat. GMO, there are no GMOs, and no, nobody's really actively pursuing that in the U.S., but gene editing is being pursued. So CRISPR is being With here. the intent of commercial, yes. So Lee, I had a question, uh, or, or maybe either for you or Jared, I don't know who's doing this, but so you're doing genomic selection for multiple traits. How are you doing that as an index or going for the highest values for specific traits? How, how are you balancing those? Yeah, so um, every generation, I think it's, I've used a slightly different approach. Um, what, what I usually do is look at the differential, the selection differential I'm going to get for each trait. Um, and in some ways it's not surprising that our, our progress on yield has been kind of constant because I've, I've really um, kind of tried to hold the selection differential for yield per head at least to be pretty constant and then look at how many other traits I can select for as well without sacrificing too much on that single trait. So obviously we'll make the biggest gain for one trait if you only consider that one. Um, as I've had larger populations, we've been able to add in more traits that we considered and still get the same kind of progress predicted on, on yield. Um, overall, I've generally used an index of several important traits, like Jared mentioned, uh, seed size, yield, free threshability, and non-shattering, and non brittle rachis as well. Um, those being kind of the most important traits, calculating index, uh, Weighting them e equally, or sometimes I've weighted uh, seed size a little stronger because the diversity for it is genetic diversity is lower. Um, but then I've I've always uh, been hesitant to throw out outstanding plants for any given trait. So if we have um, a plant that has much bigger seed than anything else, it's pretty hard to throw that out entirely. So um, we definitely kept some of those plants that were the most outstanding for even one trait if they weren't so good on other traits. Um, 
we did some cycles pairwise crossing. So we would take those plants that were excellent for say seed size, but low on yield and then make the pairwise cross with the highest yielding, but lower seed size to try to get recombination between those traits deliberately. Um, now we're to the point where um, I have much less extreme uh, plants where something's really good for one trait and very poor for other traits. And it's a lot easier to get plants that are pretty good on an index basis for kind of all the traits. Um, as you've seen, the, the, you know, earlier on, we had very few plants with high free threshing. Most of them were down around 15%, and now they're, they're all 50% you know, and above. And so therefore, it's, it's pretty easy to, to find plants that are acceptable um, for multiple traits. And so the, the number of traits that I consider in the index is, is going up and we're able to get plants that are pretty consistently good for all of them. Uh, hi, uh, I have a question for Jared and also for you. Maybe start with Jared, the first question. Can you hear me? Yes, I, I can hear you. Okay, so for the spec yield, cycle seven, cycle eight, cycle nine, the prediction actually really varies. And uh, I'm not sure I hear you clearly when you train the model uh, for cycle A, do you update the model? For example, you cross cycles, you using the phenotypic and genotypic from the past two cycles or whatever previous years data to train for next cycle. Then my expectation is because if you use cross years, cross cycles data, your prediction accuracy shouldn't be worried eh, that much. So have you update your model every year with current year or previous year's data? Yes, yeah, so we, we update with the previous year data. And I, I mentioned just on the, the very end about the perennial nature uh, cycles seven, eight, and nine were really made, I, I considered like spike yield in that first year, a separate trait compared to spike yield in the second year, which now we're, we're dumping all of that data year one, year two, year three of spike yield together and making just one uh, predicted value for spike yield. Um, but I, I think also like the cycle eight would have been only predicted from cycle six, which was two, I believe was pretty two harsh growing years. And then cycle seven was better. So I think we see in that cycle eight prediction just a little bit more G by E because we didn't have uh, a typical or average year uh, for, for spike yield based on our training population. <laughs> You know, it might average out to be typical, but any one selection cycle was not uh, by any means uh, an average year. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Lee, in your third slice, I see across years, I'm not sure I understand that slice. When you apply dynamic selection, I see the that bar is really wide. And if you can huh. share your third slice, if you if yeah. don't mind, yeah. And then from that slice, when you apply dynamic selection, uh, why the prediction variation is so big? Some of those has high accuracy. Some of those, yeah, this is slice, well, maybe previous one even uh, more clear. If you go, yeah, you see here, when you apply dynamic selection, for example, the year 20, and uh, I see the clear increase for sure. But I also, I see some dead points really low. Yeah, so, and, it, uh, so it, uh, th there's a specific reason for that. Um, in this, uh, this set of, of plots here, um, I assembled uh, a, a variety of different uh, groups of plants contributed to different plots and so, uh, by average, they all they represented the, the population, but there were some that were better for yield. There were some that were better for free threshing, some that were better for naked. So I was actually kind of looking at 
how good our, our genomic selection did at each of those individual traits by pulling out uh, groups of plants predicted for different things. So that, that means that on average, it's that the, the appropriate mean, but the variance is very, very big because I had um, different uh, sub-selections uh, okay. represented in there. So it's, it's not uh, just a single population. Well, that makes perfect sense, so thank you. Yeah. Are there any <clears throat> additional comments and uh, questions for Steve, Jared, or Lee? I've got one more it was for, for, I guess, both Lee and Jared again. So how are, are you concerned about reduction in genetic variation as you, you know, put such high selection intensity on this material? I know we, we've talked about this before and we're going to be exchanging some germplasm, but are, are you looking at new germplasm introductions or how, how concerned are you about that issue? Yeah, so um, I did uh, introduce some new germplasm uh, back quite a few generations uh, earlier on for uh, seed size, because I could tell the variation for seed size was kind of low and free threshing um, and early maturity because uh, there wasn't much variation for maturity in this, in this population. So those three things, we, we crossed in some diversity to try to, to solve some of those problems. Um, the, the bigger question of our, how much are we reducing uh, genetic variance? Um, I think that with the current uh, population size uh, being selected of 100, we're doing a pretty good job of maintaining genetic diversity. Um, and the genomic selection actually seems to maintain genetic diversity, I think, a little better than previously I was doing it based on uh, pedigree uh, blups. And there, the, the family that something belonged to would kind of overwhelm anything else. And so we would end up wanting to select a lot of individuals from the same full sieve family even uh, because the predictions were you know, just better than anything else. So it was, it was harder to keep our genetic variation there. And with the genomic selection, we usually only select a, a couple of plants from the same full sieve family. Um, we, we maintain uh, a lot of the, the lineages uh, in, the, in the population. The one way that I've looked at uh, changes in genetic variation is to actually look at the, um, the changes. If you look at the, the predicted values from the, the genomic selection uh, model um, of all of the cycles we've done going back, um, is that, do we get a, a decrease in the prediction variance? Um, and so we, what I've seen so far is that the, the mean is predicted to, to rise as it, as it does in evidence in the field, whereas the genetic variance um, re has remained basically constant, um, no statistical difference um, in decline of, of the predicted values. So that's some evidence. Um, I think we can it, evaluate this other ways. Obviously, there remains a huge amount of variance to in the field, every time we go to look at, you know, every single training population, we look at the genetic variance and it remains extremely large for all the traits we're looking at. So as long as we're having very high heritabilities driven by high genetic variance, um, we're not at a crisis point yet. What do you think, In Jared? that one graph, I can't remember who showed it, that, uh, that showed that each of the breeding programs are resulting in distinct populations, right? right. Have you guys thought about sharing high by high for your various traits across uh, that selection base that you guys have created? Yeah, and there has, I mean, I've, I've back when Jaffe was at Minnesota, I continue to send more material. I don't think I have recently, but yeah, we have done that. Um, and now we're, we're having a cross uh, environment evaluation. So um, we were under the FFAR grant that we have, we're uh, swapping our materials to the different locations and evaluating them uh, under that. So that'll be interesting to see. But I, I was thinking about making crosses though. Yeah, so it, I mean, if we find things that are obviously better, then it's gonna be good to make that cross. Um, yeah. 
for, for, for yield per se, it seems like we're going in a different direction, but for something like uh, free threshing ability or um, shadow resistance, you know, there might be some reasons. Although for the most part, it seems like we're, we're using a lot of the same alleles already. I see. Yeah. Yeah. As as to using this as a crossing Paris, have you done any cross combination prediction using genome selection? For example, Dan said the the highest by highest, and then highest by medium. So which one? Well, you went from the high group to high group. You have more population, more choices to make crosses. Which are the top? Five percent, top one percent. You want to make that cross as soon as possible. Have you done anything cross combination prediction? Well, so lately we've been doing. Um, we what I've kind of found is that it's that it was very hard to predict what was a good cross. Um, so I would think that a, a cross was going to be the the best cross for a certain trade, and it would turn out it would not be at all. So um, I switched to a uh trying to get the largest number of crosses rather than trying to get specific crosses made so now we do uh primarily random outcrossing in the greenhouse so we put our selected plants in the greenhouse clone them multiple times uh, we we set up large fans to blow the pollen around and then we scramble the plants around every day or so during pollination so um we're trying to get uh, the largest number of possible uh plant by plant crosses that we can rather than um, any, obtain any specific one. Yeah, I, as a breeder, I really hope the Navi selection can beat breeders uh, believe because breeders, traditional breeder, you always cross best with best. And uh, if we, any Navi selection can beat that or increase that concept, that, that would be, that would be, it. that would be good. And uh, I, Kevin Smith is not here. He developed that popular to predict the uh, best, or uh, to predict which combination will produce progenies with most potentials. And, and we have the so so it's random, uh, you know, intermating, which you could say it's the best by best because it is the what we think are the hundred best individuals, <coughs> but just looking at uh, like diversity of what we genotyped out of that, if you were making directed crosses like the TLI cycle six and before, it, you'd have to more than double your, your resources in terms of crossing blocks, plants evaluated to get to the same diversity that we've seen just by a, a random intermating. Yeah. Well, Lee, Jared and Steve, uh, we certainly appreciate this great update. You know, we're all um, excited about all of this work and uh, the Forever Green uh, initiative and, uh, and the scientists within it are just proud to be partners with you guys. And, and uh, even Carmen Fernholtz uh, as a major producer here in, in Minnesota. Do you have something you want to say, Carmen? Uh, no, but I apologize. I had a must attend meeting and so I missed most of this, but uh, uh, Connie told me you will be putting this on a website that I can watch it at a later time. Well, it'll be expensive, but we'll <laughs> probably. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, but, and yeah, I, I really apologize. I wanted, this is the one I wanted to listen to today. And everything else happened. <laughs> well, again, thanks uh, to all three of you. And uh, we look uh, forward to continuing this late, great, collaboration across the country uh, led by the Land Institute. So we really, really appreciate everything that's been done, especially to you, Lee, um, uh, all the things that you've done to, to move uh, the development of this grand partnership across the country. Uh, we're, as a um, graduate of the University of Minnesota, we're just damn proud. <laughs> yes, sir. You bet. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.